Thanks, Abby. Uh, so it's great to have Artie Kempner and Phil Rourke with us. We are going to discuss directing. Uh, this is this is a lot of fun for me because, you know, the cool thing about being here in the U.S. is F1 can get you started in the morning and then NASCAR can take you through the afternoon. So if you love racing, it's a really great place to be. Um, really great to have you both with us. I want to kind of begin with, the, we're going to roll through the whole philosophy of directing uh, your, your your relative sports. And what's cool is, is you know, obviously both racing, very different starting issues. Um, there's different lo different levels of sexiness for both of them, right? I think NASCAR is a little more grassroots, F1 a little more up here, uh, you know, but it's great. I love it both. Um, you both have the same challenges. So let's start with a pre-race philosophy because I think a lot of people, you know, there's a few days of qualifying, obviously going up to the race. Um, there's the, you trying to figure out story storylines and storytelling. And, you know, obviously storylines can evaporate on the first turn um, or even before the race even gets started, to be honest. Um, so Artie, from your perspective, how do you kind of roll through identifying uh, storylines that you want to focus on during the race? Well, I, I think we always kind of start, you always need to start with the headline. What's the headline of the week? You know, a lot of times that's what are we coming off of, right? What happened last week? And you know, like right now in NASCAR, Kyle Larson is the hottest thing. You know, it's an interesting story, what happened with him. And uh, I, I don't look at this as a resurrection or a redemption story. I really kind of look at it as here's a great driver that got, got another great opportunity and is taken advantage of. So I think that is really the essence of kind of what we do. We want to catch people's attention with those headline stories. Uh, we do have some sexiness at NASCAR. I mean, you know, we yeah, have lives yeah. that make women go swoon. You know, <laughs> we used to have a young woman that made uh, men swoon. So I think um, we do have a little sexy. And I think sometimes th those stories, you know, when you dig into people, uh, that's part of it. I, I think it's important to, to dig into the people as well and find out about them. I am a, the hugest drive to survive fan, which to me has opened the eyes of so many people to Formula One. And I mean, I was a racing kind of fan who watched Formula One and kind of took things in. I now have rooting interests in people. And I think <laughs> Drive to Survive created that. And I think for, for us in, uh, in, in our pre-race show, we need to look at kind of why that has stimulated so much interest in, in some ways in NASCAR, some envy in what Formula One is. Look, you were right at the beginning, Ken, there's nothing sexier than F1 when it comes to racing. I mean, it is, it is something else. And I get excited watching every race, you know, Sunday mornings. And, uh, you know, we have to create the same thing for Sunday afternoons. Sure, sure. Yeah, Phil, from, well, from the F1 perspective, how do you approach storytelling and pre-race identifying the lines, the storylines? Well, I mean, yeah, thanks, Artie, very much for saying that. But I think, you know, it's very much the same approach. You know, we're looking at what's happened at the previous race. So, you know, from Baku, we've got, a lot of content to sort of wade through um, post that race. So we'll be looking at the stories that have popped up in the meantime, you know, between uh, then and now. Um, so, you know, our team of people will be looking at uh, all of the stories that, uh, that have evolved from that. Um, you know, sometimes we have to be a bit sensitive to what's going on, bearing in mind sort of the, the situation we've got there. So uh, we have to balance that. But, you know, Artie, I think you're right that the people behind the sport um, it's one of the frustrations of, I suppose, being a world feed provider that you can't dial in. You've not got your own commentary team to dial in to, to the paddock stories. And, you know, we have a camera in the paddock at the beginning of the sessions, but we can't dial in to what they're saying and, and guide our commentary teams for that. And uh, I suppose it's, uh, you know, that's one of the frustrations, I suppose. But we can show pictures of them talking in the paddock. And hopefully that will spur on the, the commentary teams to, to talk about it and kick off that subject. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's quite a, uh, a big ship to steer through, you know, when you're a, a world fee provider to, to make sure that people are on the same narrative that you're trying to, to get across. I think sure, that's probably sure. one of our biggest, uh, biggest problems, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I want to start with the, um, <clears throat> let's go with the start of the race. And I, I got to be honest, I think that you know, the start of an F1 race is, is, is about as dramatic as you can get, right? Everyone's kind of there. It's just, it's just who's going to get to that first turn. That'd be scary um, at times. It's, yeah. It's mad, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a bit of madness. So I want to have you both discuss like the first five to 10 minutes of the, the actual racing and how you kind of set the, set the story and set the whole event up in those first five to 10 minutes. So, so Phil, walk us through as far as, 
you know, the, the, that first turn and sort of what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to show. Um, Cause it is a challenge, you know, you're trying to show the leader the first turn, but then you got obviously a lot of stuff happening six or seven rows back. So how do, how do you kind of roll through that? What's your philosophy for directing that first five to 10 minutes? Well, I think, you know, obviously the most important thing is that we all see the start lights at the beginning. You know, that's one of the biggest nightmares I have actually waking up and uh, thinking, oh, I've missed the start. Um, you know, not that easy to do. But I think once you're once you're into that situation, um, as you say, you know, going into turn one, you've got at least 20 stories that will pop up at the same time. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we take quite a, a cautious approach to that that's first couple of uh, corners really to sort of keep the framing wide obviously the the size of the grid is going to dictate how wide you're framing to show how you know how many cars are battling further down the field um you know probably a couple of years ago we elected to keep the starts low so you know the, the tight long lenses that we use um just so you've got the cars filling the frame the dust the, you know the um, unpredictability of what you're about to see um, that comes into it. And, and I think you know, our philosophy is that we can always undo that in the start replay package. We've got plenty of time to do that, particularly, you know, if there's a safety car, we can go back and revisit the angles. So I suppose, you know, the first, the first lap is the one where you're just settling into, you know, just showing what's unfolding. You know, I tend to stay away from cutting on boards in um, because I think you just need people need to see what's going on around, you know, not only the leaders, but you know, as you say, further back in the field, you've just got to capture that. Because if I was sitting at home, I know that if I've just cut to an onboard and I'm just watching the person in front, I'd uh, I'd probably hit the roof. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's just important to sort of capture the whole um, experience at that point, really. So the, the start replay, which is obviously a big part of that, you know, when there's an incident or something. You, you tend to roll that, you know, you let you, it's a couple minutes later, usually you kind of let that. So is there a time when you roll that package of, of those sorts of things? Cause you don't want to immediately cut to that, right? You kind of, you do say, oh, there's something happened. Then you kind of come back to it 90 seconds later or whatever. So is there a rhythm to that or? Yeah, um, kind of a rhythm, to be honest, if there's been a big incident at turn one on the first lap, we will try and get a quick angle of that in um, depending on what's going on. You know, if it's still, if the cars are still fighting and bunching up, then We'll, we'll just stay on that until we get to uh, a good opportunity for start replays. Generally, you know, you're looking at probably lap, end of lap two to lap three, um, because then we've got the added complication of the DRS being enabled, which means the cars are going to get closer, which sh shrinks your window of opportunity to, uh, to get the start replays in even more. So, you know, if we haven't had a chance for one quick angle, then we'll tidy it all up in, in the start replays. Um, and as I said, if there is a safety car, if the incident's big enough for that, we all take a sigh of relief and think, okay, right, we've got loads of time now to, to, to unpick what's happened. You know, we've got a very experienced team of people that, uh, that I'm lucky enough to work with. Um, and we've all worked together for a very long time. So we, we just know the rhythm um, of, that, of that start sequence. Right, right. Yeah, already from your perspective, what's your sense? Of, what's your how do you approach the first five to ten minutes? And I guess NASCAR now we have a different you know whole race format, so you kind of reset that that uh, first five ten minutes philosophy throughout the race because of the of the way it works now. Well, first I want to follow up on what Phil said because we went through the same process of how you do the first lap or two because we did we did kind of go for sexy and tight and those types of shots but now once they go green i've been using the aerial a lot to show that first lap or even two laps which are shorter than what what uh, f1 goes you know our laps like last this past week were you know the 30 second laps 31 second laps so mm -hmm. I, I hung on the aerial for for two laps to see things sort out because in all sports the restarts or the starts are when you're going to get passing and you know Phil talks about it exactly how I think about it. It's we're viewers as well. We're fans. And mm. if we're not directing the way we want to see it, where, you know, we can see around the car, it's, uh, you know, we're doing a disservice to our, or, or to our viewer. So we, we are, our, our philosophy is the same. My philosophy is exactly what Phil's is. We can get to that replay. We can come back to it. Now we have done a two box treatment of it and remember we are catering to one announce booth you know we're not doing a world feed 
So we can yeah. go to that two box. We don't have DRS to worry about, um, you know, but we do have some passing to worry about. And it's the same mm -hmm. thing. So we've been doing two box if we feel that that restart, there was a significant impact, you know, somebody spinning the tires. Um, so I think men, the, the mentality is exactly the same as how we look at stuff, as how uh, Phil and his F1 team are looking at it. And I think it does the viewer, the, it gives the viewer what they need. Right, excellent. So yeah, I want to shift gears to a uh, good, good one, right? I want go. to shift gears to talk. Uh, that was not on purpose, so, sadly. <laughs> um, favorite storytelling tools, and and Ardia, you and I've discussed a little bit. Obviously, the pandemic opened up some new opportunities for some new tools. So where where do you stand as far as there's amazing graphics? There's obviously the drones that that you're relying on. How do you how do you kind of look at your favorite tools in a in a race um, right now? As far as the things that you really love. Well, I I think the drones a real difference maker. And we are, you know, we're still, we're still experimenting in a lot of ways with how to use it, you know? And the, the one thing I'll tell you is that as a veteran director and somebody that's done this for years and years and years, I think I get the latitude from the people in Los Angeles, my bosses to kind of try stuff where I think Phil and F1, it's a different, they, they have all these bosses that you're working for, right? You know, you, you can't try stuff. It has to be tried and true. So we, I don't like to have a, a science project out on a live broadcast, but because we don't have practices anymore and we don't have any qualifying shows for the most part, we've been trying things and really trying to dial that drone in because I think once, I think we really showed it at uh, Sonoma last week and then even this week in All-Star Race, what the drone can do for the fan and how close it can come. And in watching that, the other race series, SRX, and watching what they did on their first weekend out and using the drone, it's like, it makes people go, wow, I can get closer to it. And that, that is the most important tool for us, whatever it is, is making the fan more intimate with the, with the event you're doing, bringing right. them closer, letting them almost touch it. And that's what I think we're always trying to do. And the drone is one of those things for sure. Do you, so you, um, before we started, you were mentioning the, the, the SRX uh, new league that started here in the U.S. and you know the need for speed and to visualize that is always a challenge because when you go to a race and you hear first of all when you hear the cars that's one thing um, when you see them go by at the speeds that is a completely another so how do you feel uh, or do you have a, a, a tool that you use to really connote you know what's the best way to show that speed and give a sense of that speed because if, you, if you're flying alongside of it you can't necessarily feel that speed so what's what's the trick or are there other tricks there I think there's two tricks and it starts with your audio team <laughs> I mean, your audio team brings okay. speed to life. Like you said, you can't feel it when you're, when you're on TV, unless you have surround sound, mm. you can feel it. it you, there's nothing like a racetrack experience, really. I mean, it really does make a difference. My wife, who does not, really is not a NASCAR fan, when she went to the first kind of race, she goes, oh my gosh, that was mm. really amazing. It's a visceral feeling, isn't it? Yes. You know, you're blown away by it. And, yeah. and you know, we try to do that, and you do that with, with your audio, but also, you know, those, those track pictures of we have on the walls, uh, sometimes I feel has, they'll have a, a, a gopher camera, a buried camera, those tight shots and the camera not moving. I think that is one of the key things. Yeah, the, the key you thing, follow, yeah. right? The fixed moment you start to fixed follow, perspective. Mm -hmm. that, that was our philosophy. My son is a, a broadcast associate at CBS working on SRX and we, we debrief quite often about sports television. And he actually said, you know, one thing is I remembered is as soon as the camera moves, the speed it diminishes and that feeling diminishes. And I said, Jack, that was our philosophy in 2000, before our 2001 season. Those robotic cameras on the walls were not gonna move. And that's kind of how we've continued to look at how to create that vis visceral feeling um, and that really intense speed shot that comes together make the viewer go wow right yeah it's funny that's no, funny because you, you um you know, the indy 500 i think every every racing fan can do an audio impression of a car going by at the indy 500 right that's what, that's it right well, we, we've had that uh, in formula one at yeah. uh, kota yeah exactly <laughs> we had exactly. someone do an impression for us yeah but uh, i'd like to go back on, on what uh, Artie said to be honest which was um you know the audio and, and the way that ties into the pictures because you know, one of our, um, it's quite a new thing that we've been doing for the last, uh, well, probably the last two seasons. Uh, we refer to it as the audio uplap. 
So by way of a graphic on screen, it's kind of telling the commentators, right, you know, be quiet, take a break, listen into the to the audio. And that's, you know, the chance for our audio team to showcase what they can do. And we couple that with um, our track director getting very tight, uh, uh, we call it tight, fast and low. Um, so basically, we're putting in some whip pans, but we're starting on the wide frame. Um, so the car's doing the work and coming towards you. And then we leave the sort of the pan until the last possible moment. So that's tied in with the sort of increased audio noise that the, the, the people are getting at home because, you know, uh, I know uh, the commentators are doing an absolutely fantastic job. But when that's laid on top of, of what audio output is that we're producing, it does flatten things. Um, so by doing this audio uplap, it sort of strips everything back and, uh, and allows people to really focus on, uh, on what we're trying to show them, which is, you know, as you say, absolute speed and the wow factor. And we also, you know, at the same time, strip all the, the large tower graphics off uh, the left hand side so that you can just visually focus into that as well. So it's just a way of um, you know, telling people, right, you know, let's let's dial into this now. Right, right. Well, Phil, let me let me ask you this, because I know that when I've been to Formula One races, uh, mostly at Coda, um, mm -hmm. in Montreal also. There's two things I love watching is obviously the cars on the track and then your helicopter, which is just amazing. Yeah. Like I'm, I feel like I'm watching like something out of like a, you know, a, a military, uh, someone's getting rescued. It's an action and, adventure uh, movie sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Our, and, our you know, helicopter then, operator is, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a fantastic team. Yeah. So much experience as well in, in lots of different other, mo you know, other motorsports. Um, but yeah, the, the moves they pull, you know, when you're, as you say, you know, when you're standing there and watching just the heli, you're thinking, oh my goodness, how are they uh, how are they able to concentrate on giving us a shot? Right. Because um, you know we've used that very dynamically over the last, uh, I suppose, four to five years that we've we've really dialed in. Because I think you know, touching back on what you were saying, Artie, about drones, you know, we um, we have quite a frustrating relationship with with drones because, as you say, we we do have quite a few restrictions to sort of stick to. Um, you know the the best drone shots are the the sort of the um the tighter faster drones that uh, that we can get which we would love and a lot of teams use them on their track days which is what you would see on youtube and think why don't they do that normally but my goodness the amount of restrictions we have to sort sort of uh, operate by and uh, the circuits have got their own um restrictions as well so um it is something that we try now to emulate on the heli by operating within the safe parameters, uh, you know, all the various CAAs give us the height restrictions and the limits. So um, we operate within that envelope, but because of the experience of the crew, they can give us some, you know, fabulous shots. I mean, I'm thinking Portimao, the, the, the lift up of, uh, I think it's a, out of turn seven, the car's coming up to the helicopter and then dropping down again. And it, it's one of the few times that you get a real sense of the, the height adjustment on the on the track because um you just you know the cameras do flatten flatten everything down to the 2d image obviously so that's the only time you get that impression of all you know it's the, a real roller coaster yeah and a couple of weeks back in, in azerbaijan there was a you know winding through the city streets and, and the shot was yeah. beautiful was, you, know, you saw the, the 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 roofs of the buildings and just, yeah. it, it, that was amazing amazing so um on to the now you have your favorite tools now obviously i'm going to get into uh, you you've both been there i think the the hardest thing you do is tell a story when there may not be a lot of stories going on, right? We've all, we all been familiar with that. You know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, how do you, so what, what are your tips for hunting for drama? Because I think everybody who's watching this is a story, a lot of them are storytellers and they've all had, there's whether, no matter what sport you're doing, there are those moments where, it, okay, this is, this is going to take a while to kind of pull something out of this. So how do you, Phil, how do you kind of approach those kind of situations and find the drama when it may not be at the front of the pack? I think the sort of key component for us really is um, team radio. That that plays a big part. Um, you know, we we clip our radio, as you know, we'll probably know, um, and it's only very slightly by about you know five to seven seconds delayed from when they've actually said it. It's just time enough for the engineer to to listen to it, check it, and give it to us and send it out. So that is probably one of the most valuable tools for hunting out the story. 
has anyone got a problem? You know, there's always the you know, drivers that like to, to build a story. I think they're very good at building stories. Um, so that is probably one of our most important elements. Um, we've just introduced the FIA to team radio as well that we used first used in Spain. And I think it, it really came to the fore in Baku. Uh, yeah, we got some very good radio, very good content there during the red flag period, which is normally quite, uh, you know, quite dull. Obviously, you're just waiting for the race to restart, but it just gives you that little bit of interest to, to sort of keep, uh, keep a thread on. Um, and I think, you know, during a, a dull race where the, the gaps are static, no one's getting any closer. Um, we would also look to graphics. So, you know, what are the drivers doing? How are they going to build up to the lap? And we've got various uh, AWS graphics now that can tell us how long it's going to take for a driver to catch another driver, just to try and keep that sort of, um, you know, the jeopardy, I suppose, and the, and the uh, unpredictability of it going. Um, and we can also balance that with uh, heads up display graphics on the on the onboard shots where we superimpose it over the halo, just again, to give you an idea of what the driver's going through, how long it's going to take them to get closer. But, you know, I think, um, and my team always uh, have a go at me for this, but I'm a great believer of what are the clouds doing? What, what's the what's the weather going to do? Is it going to, is it going to rain? You know, because as you say, you are, sometimes literally just hunting for just the sniff of a story right. uh, and it can be quite hard but um but you know you know if you've seen the dark cloud you you will grab onto that and 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 say you know will it rain uh, generally it always rains during the day after the race but uh, right. but at least you've built that story that yeah, is, no, so our, and that, our, 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 you know i i do would tell you that the more we're more sexy and interesting on our radios because F1, every radio sounds the same because they're all engineers. Yeah. Fox, right. Fox in three, Fox, Fox. Like our guys are going, we're gonna pit, we're gonna pit. Come on now, bring it on. And it is really, it is really a much different like radio communication because we have the spotter, which Formula One doesn't have. So you have this conversation sometimes that goes on with the driver when he's ticked off at somebody. Now, sometimes you guys in, in F1 will have the driver complaining about the guy, what is he doing? But you don't have the spotter interaction. You just have the engineer in there giving them things. We need more, we need more. And our guy's screaming, let's go. Come on now, pick it up. Um, but the radio is a great, it's great entertainment. And it's interesting and it takes you to maybe a story where now you can talk about somebody. But once again, our differences come back that Phil is cutting an international world feed broadcast. And we can focus in on somebody. We can roll a piece and two box a piece on a driver, you know, and tell a little story about them. And we've been doing a lot more, probably on the Xfinity side, we do a lot more of those kind of roll-ins, which I think introduce you to people that you don't necessarily know. And I would tell you that you know, in, in any sport, even with superstars, there's always an angle and always a story you can talk about, you know, and I think that that's the challenge that we all have. But I think for F1 with the world feed broadcast, you really just can't drop in a story like you would in the same way. I mean, they may be telling a story, but Phil can't hear them. You know, like I can hear my guys, I'm following my guys or right. we're leading, you know, we're leading our guys somewhere. And um, yeah. I think that's, that's how you get, that's how you take that eight second lead and kind of build something else. Like, where are we in the points, right? Where's mm -hmm. he going team wise? You know, those things are a lot easier for us to do on NASCAR because we have a really kind of a single booth, you know, viewership kind of relationship and we're not doing the same kind of deal. Sure. So we need to send our uh, engineers to acting school then basically just to, just <laughs> yeah. to have it up a little yes. bit. Because they don't yeah. they all sound the same to you, Phil? <laughs> I can't say anything. <laughs> I, I, I just I crack up because they're so they're so sterile in their broad. Yes, I think they're dying to go. Let's go now. Come on, no excuses. Go. I think well, yeah. To be fair, they're... sometimes we do get a little bit of excitement when. Uh, right. I mean, I, I think we probably would have had a bit in Baku, but uh, but no. Yes, indeed, definitely. Yeah, Maybe it's something for the Christmas list. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of, so speaking of Christmas list. So so last question, uh, Phil. What's do you have? Do you have anything on your wish list as far as new technology or toys? I mean, there is so much you guys have at your disposal right now. What's what's still hanging out there that you would love to see? Well, I mean, I, I think you know I've seen 
uh, well, we've seen as a team, you know, um, the the mirrorless rig, the camera, mirrorless camera that uh, the NFL and uh, quite a few sports are, are bringing in. And uh, we're, we're going to start to look at that um, uh, in the next couple of races, basically, uh, just to see what it can give us. Um, because I think, you know, as a tool on its own, it'll be, uh, it's not as strong as working in conjunction with another camera. So, you know, have another camera paired with it. Uh, it can give you wide shots and we can cut in a tight. It gives it more context. And, and I think from what, from what we've seen and having discussions with the guy that's going to operate it, I think just to, just to give that shot more impact and context is to operate it in conjunction with, a, with another camera. So that's, that's something that's on the immediate list. But I think in terms of longer term, uh, obviously, you know, the world is, is changing. 5G technologies uh, we're looking at. Um, and I think that that will help speed up our production workflow. You know, it might not be something that you see immediately on, on your screens, but definitely behind the scenes, you know, it will help us. And we are a remote production now. You know, I direct from, from our studios just outside London. Uh, and we have a team of people acquiring the content uh, at the race as well. So if we could use it in a positive way to speed up our links, um, because sometimes, you know, delays between different sources can cause can cause issues. And I don't know, Artie, if you if you get a similar thing or are you still based at the track at the moment? We're, we are at the track and just to, we do. I miss have, it so much being at the track. I, I can totally understand that. You know, last year during the, during the pandemic here, when we rebooted, uh, I was the only production person on site um, because they didn't feel that the latency issues with directing, they, they felt that it was going to cause a, a real problem. So the producer, the pit producer, associate director, associate producer, everybody was in Charlotte or in Los Angeles for us. And yeah, I mean, I would tell you being at the track and getting, getting stuff before the pandemic was a real key element. Um, I would tell you now that remote production is working for us. Um, I do like being with my team. You know, I like being able to talk to the camera guys on more than Zoom and the, and the mm -hmm. replay people. I think that there really is something to it because conversations just, uh, they initiate ideas a lot of times. We didn't go into that conversation to talk about things. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and I challenge my guys, um, not challenge is not the right word, but I encourage them to kind of let me know, what am I missing here? You know, is there a shot that, that we're not seeing? You know, is Tails Away, should we hang with that shot another two or three seconds because Tails Away looks really cool? And, you know, Phil, I have limited experience on road courses because typically up until this year, we did one a year at Fox. And yeah. I love road courses. I love directing road <laughs> courses. So being at, you know, Sonoma was our only shot. And then this year at Coda, I really enjoyed just the whole process of going and, I watched all of it's your good track. Races. I watched all of your races and I can shoot it in a different way than you can um, mm. because mm. I have different bosses, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I have a kind of a audience of one when it comes to bosses and you have an audience of many. And I found Coda to be a real eye opener of what we could do and how we could do it. And yeah. I would tell you, it's just like a simple thing. Tails away shots sometimes make you go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize they were going that far up a hill, mm. right? Oh, that shot on the last corner looking back to turn one is, is, is great. Yeah. Really, really cool. And yeah. going away from it, and that's a challenge there because you really don't have a lot of camera placement areas. It no. really does show it. I mean, it's just a severe upslope as they go to the top of that. And, yeah, and it's a great shot. Th those things, being on site and talking to the guys rather than just having a Zoom, I think that's where you really miss it. And there's a camaraderie that comes, I think, with any team that helps you do a better job. So that would be my pitch to all the people there to get you back on site. You know, <laughs> get you there. Well, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> awesome. I'll talk thanks. to Chase. Oh, Chase doesn't run anymore. You know, I used to work for him. Too. <laughs> right, right. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys, so much. Really appreciate your time. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you soon.